garden crops, which are very healthy and nutritious, don't store very well. So, you know, I think there needs to be a balance between uh, fresh produce and um, like industrialized agriculture products, uh, grains and such that um, aren't as nutritious, but they do have the ability to produce massive amounts of quantities, which in turn is able to feed people very cheap. Well, it's episode two of Clayton and my podcast, and uh, we're back in the barn this morning on a little bit of a rainy uh, Kentucky morning, just a small thunder shower passed through. It, corn fodder is a little wet, so we got a few minutes to talk a little bit about the topics of the day. All right. Well, yeah, we're still getting used to this whole podcast thing, you know, just sitting here and talking in a barn. Um, so, yep, yeah, we had a rainstorm pass through. Uh, if you can hear the truck running, uh, the truck is running to keep our lights going because we don't have power out here in this barn. Um, but yeah, we're on episode two now. Um, yeah, th- we still don't really know what this is going to be. Uh, we had some ideas, but you know, starting's the hardest part. So all five of you who actually listen to these first few episodes, thank you for actually listening. <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate the support. Yeah. So um, what do we want to talk about today? I think uh, you mentioned something about talking a little bit about uh, the uh, commodity crisis of the 70s and how kind of it's lining up to um, where we're at today with commodity markets and with uh, just everything going on in the world. Very similar uh, conditions cause both. Yeah, I was watching a, a clip from uh, the Barn Talk podcast this morning and uh, they had a finance lady on there talking. I don't know if she worked with an ag lender or who she worked with, but just talking about how a lot of these numbers are starting to look very similar to what was going on in the 80s. You know, we've got, especially on smaller operations, we've got a lot of just operating loans going out. We have a lot of uh, small purchase financing going on right now. It's not, a, you know, the land sales are happening with a lot of the bigger people. Um, but a lot on a smaller scale, there's a lot of equipment buying, there's cattle buying, um, and yeah, just, just more operating costs things, you know, just to keep things running rather than long-term investments and, uh, operating cost loans are a bandaid on a bigger issue. Typically, um, it's, it's usually something that's meant to get you through a certain amount of time. It's not the long-term fix, but with the way the markets have been looking over the past couple months, um, that long-term fix is might not be coming very soon and so i don't have a ton of knowledge based on the 80s farm crisis other than you know we're kind of seeing a lot of what we have now of super high farmland prices high interest rates um, and a lot of consolidation going on you know we went from mom and pop farms left and right to still mom and pop farms just much bigger mom and pop operations that are now buying out other smaller operations in the area and now we're seeing that on a much larger scale and so neil you might know a little bit more about what all went down in the 80s and what the finances looked like then sure i mean i I wasn't uh farming in the 80s other than just um watching my dad and you know just being a kid or whatever but uh i am you know a bit of a history buff and have looked into uh you know some of the problems that caused uh all the situations we saw in the 80s and uh, very similar to what we're seeing here now. Um, you know, I mean, part of agriculture is capital. you got to have massive amounts of capital to, uh, you know, with the cost of land and fertilizer and uh, equipment. Um, you know, I mean, it's to scale very similar to the 70s. They dealt with the very same circumstances as we deal with nowadays. Uh, you know, it a combine then was more like thirty or forty thousand dollars where we're looking at you know combines sometimes upward of a million now um but i mean based off uh you know inflation they they were basically dealing that was exorbitant prices for machinery then too so um i think we've got to this point by you know we had extremely cheap capital um which drives economic growth and uh when you just print money without any um restrictions uh this is ends up what's happening you know commodity prices got overinflated and um 
when that happens, you know, people will uh, drive up their ability to produce. And and then you, you know, if that coupled with the right weather creates big surpluses. And, um, and then, you know, when uh, at some point the dollar begins to fall, because if you just print money without any... Um, you know, without any kind of restrictions, then at, there's a point when uh, the economy becomes so red hot it's unsustainable. And that's kind of where we got. The economy got super red hot. It drove the cost of commodities uh, super high. And, you know, in the short term, that's really good for the farmer but, uh, because he has lots of capital available. But um, what happens is the consumer's ability to buy that product lessons and then what happens is uh, as the dollars leave the consumer's pocket there's no money left to buy the commodity and uh, you know it's a supply and demand world so when there's no demand uh, inevitably the price of the commodity is going to fall and um, so we're coupled with uh, a falling demand because of the that humongous rise in commodity prices um, that coupled along with the banks realizing, uh, or the Federal Reserve realizing, hey, we can't print this much money uh, every day. We have to back off that a little bit and start, you know, tightening the belt. Um, you know, so you're going to have less money in the market overall. So you, you know, you have less money from uh, the lack of printing money now, and then less money just because it has left the consumer pocket and it's in the coffers of the corporations basically now the farmers did take some profits but um you know i mean they passed them down to the fertilizer uh salesmen the chemical salesmen and you know it makes uh the corporations extremely wealthy at the mm -hmm. end of the day and um yeah i think we're moving into uh i think about this a lot when it comes to business of you know you've got you know when times are good, debt's great. You know, debt is an awesome tool to have when the economy's good, when interest rates are low, when you are having good profit margins. Um, you know, everyone will tell you early on, you know, when you start a business, like, oh, yeah, like debt's a good thing. You know, you, it's, it's good to have debt. It allows you to scale. It allows you to grow. And that's 100% true. Like, you know, being able to secure that capital early on is super important. But that only works when the economy is going well. When, you know, we're, we're now in the age, you know, I'll say we're in the age when you when the economy is great, it's easy to start a business or it's easy to take out loans because people because there's just so much money flowing in everywhere. It's easy for banks to want to give out money because they're like, well, we have so much of it coming in. It's easy for us to do low interest rates. You know, the government's you know backing us. So we have low interest rate loans, all this, you know, then you're running a business and you're like, all right, sweet. Well, you know, the money's good. There's lots of work coming in. Like, let's secure some more capital so we can grow quicker. All that is fine and dandy until the market takes a downturn and all of a sudden all your debt, which is, you know, if you're doing your bookkeeping is considered a liability, you know, it's not a big plus in your books, you know, that is a liability. That's something that's going to hurt you. Um, it's those, it's those business guys who have cash on hand when the economy starts to hurt that actually survive, you know, so we've seen Silicon Valley over the past, oh, probably, probably 20 years now, just seen pretty unbelievable growth for businesses like i don't know if there's a time in history where we have seen so many companies grow so quickly at the scale that they did you know you think you know apple 25 years ago was not the trillion dollar company it is today apple 20 years ago was having a hard time just making laptops ipod iphone boom now they are super super huge businesses and apple is actually a rare outlier where they have just tons of cash on hand but all these silicon valley companies kind of led the way in saying well if we just take on venture capital investment and we take out a ton of debt with all these massive banks well we can just grow really quickly and either hopefully get acquired or hopefully actually get a product to market which is fine and dandy when the economy is good and sure. you can coast along on that but if you've watched any sort of news over the past few years, we've seen multiple Silicon Valley banks go under. We've seen multiple massive $100 million businesses go under or get bought out because they went bankrupt. Why? Because they didn't have any cash. They didn't actually have a product to sell or they didn't have a good enough product to be profitable and bring in money to take home at the end of the day. You know, they were just throwing debt money on the fire that was their finances 
and that only goes when you have debt coming in. You know, so you just start throwing out six to seven to now almost eight percent interest rates. Well, now you want to have some cash on hand. Sure. You know, now you're at the stage like, oh shoot, we're in survival mode. You know, we need to be able to ride out those three months windows. You know, I was listening to a podcast at one point and it was saying when the economy crashed in 08, you know, the businesses who actually survived that 08 crash weren't the ones who had tons of capital. They were the ones who could survive on three months with cash in the bank and not having to go knock on the door. You know, they gave themselves a window to say, all right, let's reevaluate. The farm market's a little different because, you know, harvest is, you know, the, the growing seasons typically anywhere from six to eight months you have roughly to get that out and the market can go up and down so you're just trying to play your cards right to get the most profit out of what you can and so this is where my knowledge starts to get a little out of whack so we've got these smaller producers who are able to maybe scale a little bit over the past decade because of low interest rates but now they've got all these banknotes that they have to be paying every single month commodities are dropping interest rates are lowering they can't keep up with the growth they've had you know they've now brought on equipment or employees or more animals or more acres that they're all now paying a bunch of fees on just to keep going okay well when you go knock on the bank's door and say hey you know we're going to need eight percent interest on you it's actually like hey you know you've got a lot of debt already we might need ten percent from you ten percent interest over 20 years adds up a lot and that you know that's where we get ourselves now it's like okay that's sustainable for a year, maybe two years, you may be limp by, but 30 years, you know, how do you survive 20 to 30 years of 10% interest on hundreds of thousand dollars operating notes at an operation that's only going to be able to scale one to maybe 3% a year, you know, you're not doubling your farm size every year. That's unheard of, you know? So now we're moving in this age where it's like, all right, well, we either need to totally figure out how to refinance every loan you have, or you either need to get really big or you're going to go home. You yeah, know. there there's a lot of uh, problems facing us today. You know, I think, um, you know, farming is never going to be a business that doesn't require tons of capital, and you know, like debt is uh, detrimental to the business when inflation gets super high. But at the end of the day, you know, farmers are still going to need lots of capital to operate, and you know what I think is important to remember in times like these is. Can you still take on debt and be successful now? Yes. You just have to limit the debt you take on. And it has to be, uh, there has to be a reason to take on that debt, like an efficiency or, a, you know, maybe a land acquisition that's super important or key to your business um, and not the frivolous things that you might not, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't need unless the times were really good. So, um you know, at the end of the day, you still can write debt off uh, for your taxes. So, um, but, you know, you also don't want to get to a point where if, you know, like interest rates are at 7 or 8%, and is that sustainable in the long term? No, in the short term, yes. You just don't want to get into a position where you've taken a bunch of debt out and then you see interest rates rise to the 20 or 25% level. And, you know, it becomes a... Uh, situation where you cannot service your debt and then at that point you have to look at selling uh assets to be able to recoup uh you know your bank notes so uh will we see 20 percent interest rates i'm not sure but um i think we're definitely uh this year going to see interest rates rise a couple of more times it wouldn't surprise me at the next uh quarter if they don't muffle another it wouldn't surprise me another whole percent percentage point so um, could we see 21 percent interest i hope not but i think it's certainly a possibility mm -hmm. so yeah and uh for the you know the small producer um and i would even consider us small producers we're not you know we're not a, a just a enormous i know of enormous farms in our area and i would not consider ourselves enormous farm we do have a sizable operation but um we deal with the same um problems that most every other uh, egg businessman deals with, which is uh, a constant need for capital and, um, you know, and then facing uh, very high fuel fertilizer, uh, you know, and all your other inputs, you know, are up across the board. So it's a challenging time in agriculture. Um, I also see some opportunities coming over the course of the next uh, several years. Um, 
you know, with uh, always with with every bad, there always comes a good out of it. And uh, I think, you know, over time, um, you'll see, um, you know, as you know, like as prices bottom out, you'll see added demand come back into the market because as you uh, reduce the cost of, you know, commodities. Maybe it brings somebody else in the business that hadn't been in the business before because they see that opportunity to invest in, uh, you know, as that low commodity price to be a bargain. And then that produces a new end user, and maybe you get massive amounts of new end users. And then, you know, in the longer term, as you have more end users, you have more demand, and then you see prices improve back. And, and you know, once that starts happening, uh, everything begins to regulate itself the markets work you know at the end of the day um so so what what do you think the uh you know what do you think the move is right now for mid small to mid-sized producers that are looking at all this you know we are seeing you know massive you know input i mean it's slowed down a little but there's still a lot of uh input increase to what it takes to grow an acre like sure. how do you know how do you sustain that short term is that taking out you know operating loans just to put a band-aid on the short-term high-end costs or is it you know just juggling cash around to the best of your ability to be able to actually pay all these bills that you've got starting to stack up either beginning of the year or end of year you know what does that look like you know i think uh, you, you need to have a a good solid plan in place so you need to know where you're at in in terms of uh, cost of production um, just making sure you're staying within a reasonable cost of production you know that at this time um, with the situation that we're in uh, you know the vanity bushel isn't going to make you as much money as just the uh, what you need to get by with so I think it you know like the way I look at it is what's our most important input on the farm and it's calcium. So, you know, you, you start by making sure your pH is right in your soil. And if, you know, you can address that successfully, you start to look at, uh, you know, like which commodity is going to make me the most money in this season. You know, uh, if your cost of production is super high on corn and the price of corn is low, um, rotations are always good, but they're only as good as your ability to, you know, produce a profit so uh, I think you need to take a look at uh, the hard choices of picking a commodity that can make you the most money and uh, reduces your risk so maybe that acre of corn that you've been growing and it's you know to me I mean corn's the funnest crop uh, for a you know midwestern guy to produce corn's very fun to produce um, you know it might not be the best option for the year as much as it kills me to say that you know because I love to grow corn or whatever and I'm sure a lot of other guys do too, but um, you know the acre of soybeans is much less risky and a lot easier to turn a profit in. So it reduces your operation cost, and uh, it um, you know it it's very drought hardy. So if we did you know set in here with another uh, drought in 2024, um, you know you're you're not uh, at the mercy as much as growing a dryland corn crop would be you know if you're under irrigation you're in probably a little different situation than uh we are here in kentucky and our geography but um i think you still got to look at uh you know you got to look at your rotations you got to look at uh the amount of capital it takes to produce those rotations and then decide whether it's a good option or not to um to stick in the rotation you're in Um, i think you know spending money wisely uh if you can create an efficiency um you know if you can reduce labor by creating that efficiency um i think that's a good smart way to spend money i think um you know there there's some other uh you know you look really closely at your fertilizer program is it um is it built to make you a profit in that season or are you uh trying to compete with your neighbor so some of those things uh i think you've got to take a really hard look at right now to just make sure you're trying to be the most profitable and i think another thing to look at is a marketing program where um you know where your cost of production is exactly and you know 
at what level you can turn a profit and uh, what level you need to lock that grain in to turn a profit. And you look more at that than trying to make a windfall profit. Don't try to hit the home runs. Try to develop a marketing plan where, hey, I know my cost of production was X and I have to sell a commodity for this. And if you achieve that level of pricing, you take the opportunity and you don't wait for the windfall profit. And, uh, you know, like, is it, it's not always bad to, um, to not achieve massive growth every year, to achieve sustainable growth over a long term uh, by making wise decisions, I think is, especially in today's market, what we need to be looking at very hard. Yeah, you don't need to be a gambler to be a farmer. You know, no. you don't need to, you don't have to hope for the market to do what it's going to do. So would you say it's better for a farmer just to focus on that baseline profitability rather than just whatever revenue they could possibly, you know, like there's there's the revenue mindset of like, well, if I just increase my revenue, you know, percentage by percentage every year, that means we're doing good. But, you know, you pair that with like, okay, yeah, you're increasing in revenue, but your actual take home the end of the day you might still be in the negatives you, yeah. know, you might not actually be profitable you might just be putting you know supplement would you say it's better to be a profitable farmer than a revenue hungry farmer I, I totally agree i mean i think it's um you know key to to sus- long-term sustainable growth in our industry is to be profitable and um, i think instead of you know it's what i've learned as i've went in my career is is it good to produce lots of volume it's very good to you could be uh, successful producing lots of volume but what's even better is uh, producing that volume you know with a good sustainable price so um, I think if you don't have somebody that's marketing your grain that deals with it every day I think now is the time to go out and find you somebody that's knowledgeable in the markets that does it for a living there's a reason these guys are out there and um they possess a lot of knowledge, and are they going to make every uh, sale that is good in that current market? No. But what they will do is they'll take the emotion out of it for you. And uh, they look at this stuff every day. They know the times that they should be selling and the times they should be holding. And it takes that out of your hand. Not to say that you can't have input in it, but um, leave it to the guys that are professionals at it. And, and um, it always hurts to write that check to that guy, but at the end of the year, when you look back at your sales and, you know, everybody was taking a, a $1.25 uh, less at corn harvest because the basis was um, bad, and you're sitting there and you've got uh, yourself covered on, you know, and you don't have to um, worry about that cut basis because he's already situated you in a position where um, you got the best price you could get at harvest for that bushel that's what you need to look at you know i think it's um it's so valuable to have somebody that's in that position uh that has so much experience and uh and his job is to follow those markets and to understand them and if nothing else it just centers your mind on what you need to be doing and helps alleviate some of the stress of uh, deciding whether you're making the best sale or not because at the end of the day you know if we've talked about this before if uh, you know if the price of corn was at four dollars and um, you know it rises to 450 and the marketing guy sees that as an opportunity and he sells it for 450 but then the market continues to rally and it goes to five and uh, the guy that's sitting there that didn't sell his grain is like, hi, you, you didn't sell your grain at four, or I didn't sell mine at 450, but you did. And you're about to take the, you know, I think we were just talking about the, um, you know, the ability to stay profitable and, uh, you know, an economic downturn and um, just being dialed in on your marketing program where, um, you know, your cost of production and you price your grain at a profitable level and not exactly a, maybe not a win for all, uh, win for windfall profit level just looking for um, the ability to stay profitable in poor economic times Um, and you know I think there's some other things you can look at too Uh, you know you can um, you know with all these commodities the market is very volatile so uh, you know get yourself the ability to uh, hold your grain with a grain bin 
and um, your ability to either hold your fuel or or uh, schedule, you know, contract your fuel forward. So you can find a level where you can um, buy fuel at a reasonable cost of production and uh, you, you're not beholden to the market on those big, huge spikes. You can buy at a time that's right for you and not right for your salesman. Um, and, you know, grain bins are king. Always we know that at harvest, um, when there's a glut of supply, um, the the price is just automatically going to be lower. Is there um, times I have seen in my career when uh, harvest is the time to sell? Yes, but um, most of the time post-harvest, you're going to have, um, if you're not going to have rallies in the market, you'll have rallies in your basis in your local market. So um, there will be opportunities throughout the course of the year to successfully market grain you just have to look for those opportunities and uh, and don't let your salesman be the determining factor of when you're selling or when you have to sell or buy for that matter if you're talking about uh, fuel or fertilizer um, there's good times to buy those too and um, you know this is when I think you should be looking at um, at those Ford contracts or at the ability to store if you if you're not comfortable and so you can actually bring the supply onto your place and it but you set a you set an exact number on that certain commodity whether it be fuel or fertilizer you know exactly what your cost is because you've acquired it either through a contract or through storage so um you know it's not reinventing the wheel it's uh it's just sound uh thinking you know just being reasonable i think um now it's probably not the time to go and buy yourself a new Denali pickup truck. Ah, oh, darn! There go my hopes and dreams. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're talking about a little bit earlier, um, like in that barn talk, um, and they, you know, they were kind of, or the lady was saying something about industrialized agriculture and why it's uh, detrimental to the population or oh she wasn't saying that that was just the comments well we could talk about that another time you. too yeah no just the comment section we're ripping about how we don't want bigger farms we don't want this we don't want that and it's like well unfortunately this is you know and even not unfortunately it's just like hey like there's people who gotta eat like sure. we we got people we gotta feed and like there's there's a reason it is the way it is and there's a reason it hasn't gone away you know and it's not just because people want more money and the government says throw money at them throw money at them it's like if you know the government they don't love throwing money at anything other than their own programs and so giving money to farmers typically also is not top of their list to do either and so yeah anyways there's a lot of places we could go with that but yeah and you know i mean i think there's a good balance to strike, you know. I mean, I was telling Clayton a few weeks ago, I, I love to produce garden crops. It's one of my favorite things to do. But to produce a garden crop that uh, will feed my family, and not to say that I don't have surplus from my garden, but it requires a lot of labor. And, um, you know, and then uh, garden crops, which are very healthy and nutritious, don't store very long. So... Uh, you know, there. I think there needs to be a balance between uh, fresh produce and um, like industrialized agriculture products, uh, grains and such that um, aren't as nutritious, but they do have the ability to produce massive amounts of quantities, which in turn is able to feed people very cheaply. Yeah. And um, we can we could that that is a whole other topic we can cover in a whole other episode too. Like it's not like. Uh it's not a this or that thing. Like we don't have to say it's all has to be this. It all has to be that. Like I've never met a farmer on the planet who's like, Oh yeah, I don't think you should have your own garden because I produce all your food. Like those people just don't exist because no, no farmer is going to be able to produce everything that you as a consumer could ever want. Like sure. no one man, no one operation could ever produce what we as humans need just to survive. Like it's very, you, you know, you talk to any homesteader, the people who, you know, homesteading is a trend now. Like you, it it's a full time job it running is. your own garden, having your own animals, you know, taking care of it all, processing your meat, storing it, so you can have it year round. Like that is a full time job it just is. to provide food for yourself. And there's a reason 
industrialized agriculture works because the, no, we don't, not everyone wants to be doing that every day. Some people do. Not everyone wants to be out in their garden every single day weeding or out every day canning or taking care of your animals. It's a lot of work. You know, it it's, is. it's not for the faint of heart. It's, no. it's more than a full-time job. Yes, it's very labor-intensive. Uh, it's And it's one of those things that's a labor of love, you know. Like, you have to be, you have to love uh, growing things and being out in the sun and uh, doing the hot, dirty job to enjoy growing a garden or producing your own food. So, um, is it something I think we should all be doing? Yes, you should at least have the ability to grow, uh, know how to grow your food, you know. And But I think you're right, there there's a good balance between uh, what we're doing in an industrialized ag and, um, you know, it, and then what, uh, you know, the the niche uh, fresh produce market is doing. Um, do we need both? Yes. Um, but uh, does either, you know, does the industrialized ag uh, side, could it go away? And no, I don't see it in the short or long, long term. Um, at the end of the day, there's 8 billion of people to feed on the planet, and uh, we have to have copious amounts of food for those people. And, uh, you know, I mean, so yeah, we need balance. We should we should save that for the next episode because there's, yeah, that's a whole, there's a whole topic, and I, I have a lot of opinions about this just based on my experiences, based on your experiences of, like, yeah, we have, we have these systems for a reason, and they didn't just pop up overnight to line someone's pockets sure. you know and i think there's a huge misconception about that of like the modern day farmer and rancher is just in it for the money they are just in it to make a ton of money and to have high profits and to you know kill us all with leaky gut or some gluten deficiency because of the wheat we grow or gmo this gmo that is like that's that's not what's going on here like it, it, the, the the ag industry is far too large and there's far too many moving pieces and there's too many people all with different opinions within the industry itself for there to be some colluded like organized like yeah we're gonna do this like no like i've been in this i haven't been in this industry a long time but i've been in it to know that no one's on the same page here a couple people have some rough ideas but everyone has their own different thoughts and things every single company like the amount of ag companies that exist in the u.s you guys would be shocked like the it's too big and complicated for it to be some big, you know, one world government ag industry that's trying to, you know, manipulate everything to make you, the consumer's life way harder. It's like, if that's what's happening, then we're, we must be blind or something. Cause <laughs> no, that, you know, I mean, like, there's just so many, uh, just on the uh, farming, like what you would call industrial farms are mostly still at the end of the day families. Uh, some of them are, you know, multiple generational families or families that are, uh, you know, extremely large, but um, they are at the end of the day families and they all have different interests. And I can guarantee you that they don't all side one way or the other. Um, you know, it's at the end of the day, they, uh, you know, they do want to make a profit, but in the farming business, it's, uh, it's a compiling asset business that um it's not oh you know it's not one of those businesses that you're going to have these big 30 40 50 percent windfall profit years uh and just be extremely profitable it's one of those businesses where you can sustain between 7 and 12 percent growth uh hopefully year upon year and over the course of a lifetime have the ability to gain wealth um you know, and then if those families uh, manage it wisely over three, four, five, six, seven generations, uh, maybe they can accumulate a great amount of wealth. But um, it's not one of these businesses that's like, I, I guess I would consider get rich quick if there is such a thing. Um, farming is not that business. So, um, you know, we, we want to be profitable um, as families but not at the detriment of the health of the society. And I don't think you'll find any farmers that uh, go out there and feel like that there's uh, the pesticides that they apply to their crop is causing a problem, um, you know, either in their family or in others, fam you know, in, in your family. They're uh, using it wisely uh, at 
rates that are deemed safe, you know. And at the end of the day, they don't want to over-applicate anything. So uh, most every farmer is judging every application really hard. Is is it um, is it beneficial to uh, the growth of the crop uh, versus is it just uh, doing it because, you know, that's what I feel like I should do. Most people are going out there and making it uh, a decision based off pressure of a certain um, pest, be it a weed or an insect. At, at the end of the day, if you have too many insects or, or you have too many weeds, you can't produce a grain. And then um, if that grain isn't produced, uh, the supply is shortened, and then what happens? The commodity price rises, and then it makes it difficult for the consumer. So, um, you know, do, do we need management tools uh, to manage pests as Agriculture producers, yes, but uh, are we using those tools unwisely and to a detriment to the uh, health of the food supply? I don't feel like we are. So, um, you know, I think if everybody would just uh, take a step back and take a look at it and uh, and realize that the farmer or the rancher isn't out there trying to poison your family, he's just... He's trying to do the wise thing that, uh, you know, m makes uh, his crop or his animal the best it can be. Mm -hmm. Sweet. All right. Well, we'll talk about that more in the next episode because that's a whole other topic. Um, yeah. Like, follow, share, do all the things that all the other people on the Internet tell you to do <laughs> with their videos. Uh, just do just do that because I don't know the whole scripts and everything. So this should be a hopefully weekly thing. Um, so yeah, stay safe, stay farming, stay ranching, um, stay eating food, please. Uh, keeps us all happy. <laughs> People are much happier when they have full stomachs. I'm a big fan of that. So, yep. Uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, thanks for listening guys. Yep. Thanks. Thanks.